Hi, everyone. My name is Andy Rathman Noonan, and my pronouns are he, him. I'm the executive director of the National Science and Technology Medals Foundation. We're so excited to have you all here for STEM Spotlight, how to launch a STEM business. I'd like to first thank Dr. Shreya Dave and Dr. Ruth Schumann for being here to share their experiences and advice with you all tonight. And a special, special thanks to Sarah Williams, who will be leading the discussion. I'd also like to thank the National Science Foundation for their generous support that allows us to share conversations like this with all of you. And finally, thank you to the University of Texas at Arlington um, and their students for participating in this conversation. It is our mission to build diverse and inclusive STEM communities that are equitable and truly representative of our society. So where do we start? Well, it's in classrooms and webinars, just like this one, highlighting voices that are often left out of the conversation and creating spaces where students like yourselves can both learn from and relate to experts who share our goals for the future of STEM. What we hope to show through this conversation and all of our programming is that there isn't one way to build a STEM career and there certainly isn't just one perfect path to success. But there are at every turn incredible role models and mentors that you can look to for advice and inspiration. We hope that tonight's conversation with Dr. Dave and Dr. Schumann serves as one such re reflection point for you along your way. We invite you to join in the conversation and in doing so, help us create an inclusive and safe space for all. When using the chat or asking questions, please take a moment to reflect on how your language may be perceived by others here. Thank you for your contributions and for helping us create a respectful environment where everyone feels welcome to listen, share, and enjoy. One final note before we get started, if you have technical issues, please text LC Charity and they'll help you troubleshoot. They're gonna drop their phone number in the chat right now and their contact information was also listed in the event email that was sent earlier today. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Dave, Dr. Schumann and Ms. Williams to kick off the discussion. Welcome to the National Science and Technology Medals Foundation's STEM Spotlight Series, where we're meeting the top minds in STEM to learn more about their paths to success. I'm Sarah Williams, a science journalist. My pronouns are she, her. Talking with me today are Dr. Shreya Dave and Dr. Ruth Schumann, who have both founded successful life science companies and have lots to share when it comes to entrepreneurship. Shreya Dave studied molecular filtration membranes during graduate school and is now the CEO of Via Separations, a company that focuses on energy efficient filtration methods for industrial manufacturing. In 2018, she was named one of MIT Tech Review's top innovators under 35. Ruth Schumann has a background in genetic engineering and in the 1990s founded Gentra Systems, a company that developed nucleic acid purification reagents and instruments. Gentra was acquired by Kyogen in 2006 and Schumann is now the program director in the National Science Foundation's i program, which helps guide researchers who want to become entrepreneurs and start their own businesses. To all those students joining us live tonight, the Q&A opens as soon as we start talking. So if you have questions for either of these women, go ahead and submit them through the Zoom Q&A feature and we'll answer those in the second half of our event. Thanks so much for joining me today, Shreya and Ruth. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, could you each start by you know, giving me a quick introduction of yourself and a rundown of the path that's led you to where you are today? You know, When were you each first interested in science and when did the business and leadership side of the field appeal to you? Uh, Shreya, do you wanna start? Sure, I'm happy to. Hi everyone, my name is Shreya. I, my pronouns are she and her and I'm happy to be here. Um, so I think it's a, a little bit of a, a long circuitous path, but I think that's sort of the point. Uh, none of us, I mean, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up, and I think that's a common theme from folks who like to learn, from folks who are um, excited to, to kind of push the boundaries on, on science, on business, and then on the um, kind of spectrum of, of technology development. So my background is actually in mechanical engineering. I studied uh, Mechie as an undergrad, was really excited about uh, consumer product design, which is something I don't do at all right now, and I ended up doing a little bit of research around building energy efficiency, so kind of like how do buildings spend energy and how can we make that better, and then ended up in a, in a lab where I studied filtration membranes for, for water desalination, and that's where via separations kind of spun out of. Um, and, and I think that it's really, really cool to reflect and think about 
the path that got me here because none of my training was the stuff that I do day to day. And yet I love my job and it's a dream job for me. And it was absolutely kind of relevant to take, take those learnings and push them here. So today we're developing a technology that and deploying a technology that improves the energy efficiency of manufacturing facilities. So things like paper mills or petroleum refining or semiconductor fabs, you know, big, large industrial um, systems and our technology technology kind of slots in and helps them use less energy, less dollars, and um, change the way that they're, they're operating. So I can get into more details there, but wanted to start, start with a little intro. Yeah, very cool. What about you, Ruth? What has your journey through science been like? Oh, well, thank you. Uh, again, I'm Ruth Schumann, and my pronouns are she and her. And, uh, you know, uh, going way, way back, you know, I started uh, as an undergraduate, uh, thinking I wanted to be a veterinarian, and uh, ended up, you know, doing, you know, they required a senior um, uh, internship and uh, started interning as a veterinarian. Realized uh, that wasn't going to be a good idea. Mm -hmm. I'm going to graduate school um, and uh, completed both a master's and PhD in molecular biology and genetics and cell biology. So. It really, really worked out uh, well for me. I started my professional career then as a faculty member at North Carolina State University. Uh, I was really lucky to be there because they were very generous about having faculty members interact with industry. And I realized that uh, I really wanted to be engaged with industry and uh, actually uh, started a company from my university position based on the technology I was developing at the university. And that company grew into Gentra Systems. Uh, I grew that company to about 100 people, actually. It was quite an experience, um, absolutely incredible experience, actually. Stayed uh, as the founder and CEO right from the beginning to the end, which is a little bit unusual, actually, uh, and uh, sold that company uh, in uh, 2006, as Sarah said in my introduction, um, and then uh, spent a couple of years actually back at the university as um, an you know, expert in uh, biotechnology, but also uh, as a, a, a resident CEO in residence, you know, helping advise companies uh, at the university, uh, faculty members who wanted to start companies, and then eventually uh, found this position at NSF and uh, joined NSF as a program director in the SBIR program, which is the small business program, funds small businesses, and uh, spent the next uh, 10 years actually as the, in that program. It's really great uh, experience. And about a year or so ago, they asked me if I would take over responsibilities in the i -Corps program, which of course um, is also a program aimed at helping people uh, learn whether they have a technology that they want to commercialize and, and help them find, found their own business. So really, um, you know, uh, Shreya, you said you had, um, uh, experiences that maybe didn't align as well with what you're currently doing. I would say I feel absolutely wonderful because I think everything that I've ever done in my career has helped me to bring me to the position where I am today. So it's really wonderful. And I'm really delighted to have the opportunity this evening to answer your questions and share these experiences with you. Yeah. So yeah. you've really worked in, in academia and industry and now the foundation side of things. That's, that's the, right. So it really <laughs> is understand how science works, I guess. That's really, I think I've uh, been uh, able to kind of touch everything that um, people need to know when they are thinking about starting a business. So it's been okay. great. Well, let, let's talk a little bit about what each of your day-to-day -day job entails right now. Um, you know, we've heard your job title, but for students trying to think about what you're really doing, um, what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis to run a company, Shreya? I think of my role as the snowplow, and I say this to my team a lot. I'm the snowplow clearing the way so that the scientists and the engineers can develop the technology. So that might be raising money, that might be figuring out payroll, that might be understanding you know, what our customer needs so that I can feed that information back into, into our technology development group. And, and I think that's a, 
a really cool, uh, interesting place to be. Like I said, none of the, the training I had as an engineer, as a material scientist really directly lines up with those skill sets. But at the same time, I think that the ability to learn a new language, so to speak, a language around tax returns or a language around legal documents or a language around customers and sales and things like that is been a really, really useful tool. And so I think that was part, that was indeed part of my training. Um, so my day-to-day -day is probably roughly 30% things that I associate with money, whether that's, you know, figuring out, making sure we have enough money, making sure we um, are reporting our grants. You know, we are fortunate to be recipients of an NSF SBIR, formerly an i grant. And so making sure that we're reporting our grants and meeting our milestones or uh, working with our investors or, you know, paying bills. Those are all things that kind of land in, in, in our purview over here. Um, I spend about 30% of my time with customers. And so that's understanding really their pain points and how they think about things. Maybe it's signing a contract contract or um, designing a, a pilot program that works with them. So that's about 30% of my time. And then the other 30% I think of as sort of internal team stuff. Um, and that encompasses things like are all hands meetings or how are we going to recruit or spending time recruiting or other things like that, that I kind of associate with, with team management. Um, and that's sort of the, the structure, the structure of the day. I do also like to say that my my job is, is really fun and really exciting, but if it isn't for any reason, I just have to wait three months because three months from now, the job will completely turn over. I'll be good at something I didn't know how to do before, but have had to learn and maybe was really painful, but gets a little better. And <laughs> excuse me, and there'll be a whole new set of cool, exciting opportunities, challenges, and learning learning places. And so just, just gotta wait it out if you, if you don't like what you're doing at the moment. Okay, so that day to day changes. Um, Ruth, what if, what about you? What exactly is the i -Corps program and what kinds of things do you need to do on a day to day basis to make that successful and make your participants in the program successful? Thank you. So, you know, the i -Corps program is really kind of a unusual program at NSF. You know, most of NSF is making grants to researchers and, and small businesses to do research, but mm -hmm. i -Corps is a very different program. I think, I guess the way, best way to describe it to you is it's it's kind of an educational program, but it is aimed at uh, helping researchers at universities translate their technology from their university laboratories to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. As you might guess, even by the things Shreya was saying, you know, researchers aren't necessarily trained about business yeah. or uh, how to evaluate their technologies. So the i program is a program to help them uh, and guide them through a process to evaluate their technology, whether it has commercial value. And this is often a turning point for researchers to make a decision about whether they should start a company and commercialize their technologies. So it's really exciting. So my day-to-day -day job at, the, at uh, NSF is actually uh, keeping this program going, you know, it's been in existence since uh, really 2012, and um, it's it's grown to be a pretty large program. Last year we had over 300 participants uh, go through the program at the national level, and uh, my job is to help identify which people will be able to participate. I do interviews, look at their applications and uh, help identify the dates for all these programs. We ran 15, we call them cohorts, they're training programs, 15 training programs last year, okay. uh, which is, keeps us very, very busy. <laughs> yeah. so people go through this program with this cohort then? It's kind of a group of people. They do, a group of about 24 teams, we actually call them teams. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are uh, teams that have typically worked on the technology. Uh, we identify a person who's usually a student. Uh, they could be an undergraduate, but more likely a graduate student or postdoc. Uh, we call them the entrepreneurial lead. They're the person that really has the passion to see this commercialized. They might be the person that says, I want to start a company if this looks promising. And then they're usually joined by the, maybe the 
person uh, who we identify as the technical lead, the person that's laboratory that's being used to conduct the research. And then the third member of the team is usually an outside person. We call them an industry mentor, and they might be a person that um, comes from the industry that the technology will address, or uh, someone else that maybe has had entrepreneurial experience. They've started companies and kind of understand what uh, you would need to do to be able to commercialize the technology. Okay. And when you say commercialize, are most of these people hoping to start their own business and lead that business? Or is it more about selling it to an existing company or oh, launching a, a company yeah, and then- Very good question. Yeah, we think that the best way, you know, I'm sorry, so I'm gonna step back. So we're looking for something we now call deep technology. So, and uh, often the uh, research for these technologies maybe have gone on for years, you know? So they finally come to a point where they say, I think I see where it might have a commercial application, but I'm not sure what to do next. Okay. So going through the i program is really helpful because the goal of the program is to help them identify customers uh, and identify uh, the value propositions, that's what we call them, or what's important to that customer about your technology. So uh, it's really uh, the, the next step. And we think, I, and I can say from my you know, experience that if you have a deep technology, starting doing the commercialization as a startup is probably the best way to do this. Uh, and that's uh, really our aim is to help people make that decision and then be able to, to take the next steps. Okay. So Shreya, your company is actually a two-time NSF seed fund grantee. Can you talk a little bit about you know, what that meant for you and how that did help your business get off the ground? Yeah, I absolutely would love to. Um, and just to, to speak to the question in the comments, um, uh, the, the business that, that I run is called Via Separations, and we make a technology that enables factories to be more energy efficient, kind of fundamentally. And I, I say that a little bit kind of at, the, at a high level. At, at the technology level, what we do is we make a, a molecular filtration membrane that allows us to transfer from distillation columns into filtration, which is 90% more energy efficient and therefore lower cost for the manufacturer. Um, but the difference in what I just said, you know, the former was the value proposition, why the customer cares, and the latter is what we do to enable that value proposition. And those are two different things. And those are sort of two different audiences, you know, depending on who we're talking to. And that was something that we pulled from i -Corps. And so um, in 2016, I had just graduated with my PhD. I'd actually defended my thesis saying that the technology we developed as part of my PhD was uh, a cool contribution to science, but probably never going to be commercialized for a number of different reasons. And then I learned about the uh, potential applications in chemical processing. We were focused on water filtration, kind of learned a lot about chemical processing. And, and that's when I was introduced to i -Corps. And we applied to i -Corps saying, you know, there are hundreds, maybe even thousands of different applications that this technology could in fact impact. And is there a market fit? Is there a pull from the market for this? And so you know, functionally what we did was we spoke to 100 customers and potential customers in six weeks across 15 different industries and narrowed down into one uh, specific sector that could and would be our beachhead market, which by the way has all changed, but that doesn't mean all that research wasn't valuable yeah. and incredibly uh, important to kind of launch the business. And that's what gave us the confidence that we had a business, that there was a customer who said, who jumps over the table, who says, yes, I will buy this. If you build it, I will buy it. And um, that takes a lot of data points. That's not one person. That's not two people. That's got to be 30 people. That's got to be enough. You know, we're scientists, right? We need enough data to convince ourselves um, of a trend rather than a single, a single point to define that. And uh, from there, we were able to um, apply to the SBIR program, phase one and subsequently phase two. And, and phase one was incredibly important to us because we were simultaneously seeking Seeking private investment from venture capital, which again, we can talk about if folks are interested. But one of the things that is a feature of, of, of venture capital, not a bug, but a feature is that 
um, investors are generalists. They kind of pattern match and see things across different industries and are really good at identifying, you know, some are really good at identifying what has good potential market applicability. They are not scientists and we were still a science project and NSF's peer review process, NSF's kind of stamp on our technology provided that technical validation that what we were doing was compelling from a technical perspective, our investors could say, or potential investors at the time could say, well, we think this is a pretty interesting market and it's up to us as via separations to bring those together. And that's what we've been doing over the past three and a half years. Um, and, and I'm happy to talk a lot about that, kind of bringing those, those different pieces together from the development stage all the way to product deployment. Mm -hmm. Um, for students who are, you know, or early career scientists who are really interested in this entrepreneurial path, what kinds of support and education do you each recommend? You know, obviously you're fans of the NSF program, but are there other, you know, targeted programs like this? Is an MBA worth it? Is, you know, mentoring the most useful thing? What kind of, you know, general advice would you give someone who wants to go down this path, Ruth? Yeah, you know, I guess I would say, first of all, uh, there's been a huge change at universities over the last 10 years. You know, uh, prior to, uh, you know, more recent uh, times, universities didn't want to provide entrepreneurial training to students, which seemed, seems, you know, kind of absurd from this today's point of view, but uh, that's really true. I'd, I'd say part of the change in mindset has been actually programs like the i -Corps program at NSF. Um, the fact that NSF said, we think it's important that technologies um, that you're developing get out into the marketplace really uh, has caused a change at universities. I think now you'll find that there are entrepreneurial classes to take. And I wouldn't, if you are interested in that route for your career or even just interested in exploring that route, I would suggest getting into those classes. Some of them are, um, you know, formal classes for credit that you'll take, but others are less formal and kind of like short courses or introductions. And I think all are valid and that uh, you take uh, the course that you feel most comfortable in. When you talk about i or the SBIR programs, however, now you're talking about a stage where you must, um, have kind of a more mature technology uh -huh. and serious interest. So, you know, there's a starting point where you can explore and see what it's like. I really encourage you to do that. Uh, I certainly didn't have those opportunities mm -hmm. I wish that I had, but I think you do and I would take advantage of them. And um, then uh, as you get into uh, the technology area that you are interested in, I'm sure that uh, in the audience now, there are scientists and engineers of all sorts. Uh, then you start thinking about areas where you might be able to have an impact. I, I certainly think uh, today one of the most exciting areas will be in the area that Sharia is in. You know, the uh, the uh, water purification, anything doing to do with the environment. All of these areas are going to be very, very big areas of science, and I think. Um, all of you should be thinking at least about that as a possible pathway and all of them need technologies that are going to reach the marketplace. So uh, this is a really good thing and I really encourage you to uh, look into that aspect of it. The, the question, Sarah, that you asked about MBA, I think is a really, a really good one. I don't think that an MBA is mandatory for mm -hmm. starting a company. I think a willingness to learn and a, 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 a true appreciation for a literally everything is your job. So even if you don't know how to build a budget, you figure out how to build a budget from Googling and things like that. I think there's a point in an organization, and I think we, we've hit that point, or I know we've hit that point, where it does get a little... Um, hairy, you know, our budgets get a lot more complicated and it's not something that one person can do, you know, part-time everything. And so having a dedicated person to do finance, for example, or a dedicated person to do HR or other things happens as an organization grows. But at the core, I don't, I don't think 
I don't think business is rocket science. I think it takes um, a high uh, ability to talk to people and listen and hear things that customers are saying sort of from the i training process. I think it takes a huge amount of discipline. And i was another really, I, I promise I'm not paid by i but another really big uh, important thing for us to do that. You know, we were coming from grad school where you kind of work all the time. You don't really work business hours. You kind of work when you want to work and the labs are quieter at night and, and you sometimes do that. Whereas i you know, we're taking meetings with people in a bunch of different time zones, but we're taking meetings with people and we had to, we had to restructure our day-to-day -day to be business hours. And that, that was discipline that we then translated and, and still have today. Um, you know, a startup isn't like sitting on your couch and, and kind of working whenever, you, maybe it isn't COVID, but um, it's not working when whenever you want, it's, it's really having the discipline to, to grow the business in a, in a direction. Um, and then the third thing I think it takes is just a real comfort um, being uncomfortable and knowing that you're not going to know everything about every piece. You're going to be the expert on your technology and your business and your business model and, and hopefully your customers, but your customers are going to be the experts on their processes and other people that you can bring in are going to be experts on other things. I was, I was actually laughing today. I was in a meeting. Uh, we're wrapping up a construction project and so the meetings are getting shorter and uh, the person on the other side of the meeting said, oh, that was a quick one. And I said, yeah, and I'm finally understanding 90% of these meetings. When we started this six months ago, I understood 10% of two hour long meetings. And now I understand 90% of 30 minute meetings. And I feel like I've come up that learning curve. And that's, you know, that's on building, building a lab, you know, a, a skill set that you know, I certainly wasn't trained for, never thought would be part of my job. But as part of growing the business became part of being the snow cloud became my job. Okay. Um, so Shreya just gave us a great overview of kind of what it takes as a person to run a, a company. Ruth, are there particular things that, you know, most successful i ideas, not necessarily people, but um, ideas have in common or things that make them often not as successful? You know, it's not, again, so much the idea. We really fund uh, of these technologies across all technology areas. So uh, we are, and we actually encourage anyone that has uh, done basic research in an area that they may they they think may have a commercial opportunity to apply to I Corps. So uh, we do not, however, um, just fund someone with an idea. You you mm -hmm. have done the basic research, uh, have some validation that it looks like it looks promising, so that you can really. Uh, go out now and explore um, what customers are looking for and compare that to what you've done. So that's that's kind of an important uh, aspect of what we do. And um, I, I think as you think about um, uh, applying to the program, uh, you, you really uh, you really do need that technical expertise and experience to kind of back that up. You become much, uh, you, you may not have those business skills that uh, Shreya just described. Uh, you will gain those, mm -hmm. um, really do need that technical background to understand what, uh, what the customers are saying to you. And I'd love to tack on, you know, uh, in our program, I'd say 1% of our applicants are MBAs. So okay. our program really is technology people, scientists and engineers, that's who apply. And they all come in, without that basic business knowledge. And that's what we're looking for, that you don't have to have that. Uh, that's what we're hoping to show you. And we use, it's a, the i program is actually based on the scientific process. You form a hypothesis, right. your technology, and you go out and talk to customers to test that hypothesis. And you don't tell them about your technology at all. It's not about sharing what you're doing or what you've done. It's really uh, uh, forming a hypothesis and testing how they respond to that when you interview them. So it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. It's kind of a twist on the scientific methodology, but using yeah. it for a market research purpose. Okay. Um, Shreya, what are your goals with VIA separations right now? Are there particular things you're hoping to see the company achieve in the next few years or benchmarks that will tell you that you're on the right path? 
Oh, of course. Uh, depending on who I'm talking to, those goals are either really long term or really short term. In the grand picture uh, of things, you know, we want to displace energy consumption. We want to reduce U.S. energy consumption by full percentage points, and and we can do that with this technology and with the platform that it enables. So that's that's what gets us out of bed every morning. I would say everyone on our team sort of is motivated by that vision and by the opportunity for uh, you know, increased access to things like e-commerce or, um, you know, disposable diapers or things that we use every day, but have a real impact on the planet. And so doing that with a lower impact on the planet. And so that is that is our that is our core fundamental mission. In the in the nearer term, we are deploying our first commercial demonstration system next year. And so we've got a site, we know where we're going, we know who we're working with, we're going to be doing a couple of these, and we have to deliver. And it's really important that we um, not only deliver the working technology, but deliver the team that can support it, that we deliver the economics that the customer expects, and that we deliver, you know, the customer service that the customer wants to see at the at the end. And so building that organization, building that physical system is also happening at, as we speak, um, maybe maybe not exactly at this moment, but um, as we speak. And, and that is that is sort of what our, our team is looking forward to. Okay, exciting. Um, Ruth, what about the i program? Are there ways in which you'd like to see that change or grow, grow over the near future? Uh, well, you know, I, I really love the i program. It's one of the reasons NSF asked me to step into this role. I've always been kind of a cheerleader. And, and I really think that the very best technologies come out of our universities and university research. So I really love that. But if, if I had the opportunity that is NSF found funding for it, I would expand uh, the program to include uh, small businesses that are uh, in the deep technology area across the US. Right now, the funding is earmarked only for uh, academic researchers. So the, the, uh, the sum of the program is kind of focused on academic translation. But I would love to be able to offer this program to small businesses that are still looking for their first funding. And I would also like to see every SBIR company go through the i program as well. Many times you think of uh, getting that SBIR award as, me, uh, as an indication that you uh, have uh, all the knowledge you need about your market. And unfortunately, that's just not the case. And so uh, I would love to see our phase one SBIR companies have the opportunity to participate in i -Corps. And actually this year I have started pilot programs in the four SBIR phase one grantees uh, where we have modified the program, you know, so that's really addressing the needs of SBIR companies. It has been very, very exciting. So I'd love to see that grow. Okay. Great. Well, as we continue chatting, I'd love to hear from some of our student listeners. Um, yes. Anyone, feel free to go ahead and submit questions using the Zoom Q&A feature. If anyone wants to ask a question themselves, either on video or through your microphone, you can also use the raise hand feature and we'll try to call on you. Um, we have uh, Luis who asked, how difficult was it to build your companies? A lot of tears and sweat. And I'll just tack on to that, you know, what are what really were the biggest barriers, you know, for your first company, um, you know, that you had to overcome? What was that like? Shreya? Well, I'll say I don't I don't know yet. We'll see. Um, the, I, I will say that uh, running a company and growing, uh, I guess, developing a technology, growing an organization and, and managing a team is definitely hard work, but I would say that, you know, any anyone here has experienced hard work too. So there's nothing, there's no secret sauce to it. And there's no, um, it's no, no real, real shift from, you know, that the growth mindset, the discipline and, and kind of what my mom calls stick to um, the, you know, tenacity to, to stick with something uh, that, that is, 
that kind of came out of, of studying engineering, you know, engineering was hard for, for me as well. And, and I don't think that that is really different. I think the, the coolest part for me is how rewarding it is, kind of the flip side, how exciting it is to, to enable people to, to be their best and, and develop a technology. Uh, one of the metrics we use for, for manufacturing scale up is area, how big can we make our system? And we've scaled up by 2.8 million times over the course wow. of the last three years. And that's just fun to be able to look yeah. back. And um, another example is, is my CTO and co-founder uh, were just looking at our, our kind of projected goals from this time last year. So the end of 2019 and what we wanted to accomplish by the end of 2020 and looking at them and being like, wow, we knew nothing but we did everything. And like that combination is, is really fun and, and being able to, to support people, support human beings. Um, so, so for me, the hardest part is, is absolutely the people. The, the best part is 100% the people. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a real fun, cool ride. Okay. What about you, Ruth? You know, looking back to your experience starting up Gentra, um, how, how hard was that? Oh yeah, it's, uh, it's actually, um, not so hard to start the company, but really, really hard to grow it and make it successful. That it's it's definitely a challenge. Uh, you you've heard uh, Shreya talk about all the jobs that she does. Uh, she has many hats in her company. You really have to come in with the idea that you're going to roll up your sleeves and probably do anything that it takes to get it cut off the ground. And I, I think one of the things that surprised me the most uh, as I was growing my company was how it changes. So, and, and Shreya kind of indicated this as well, you know, there, it, it's never the same. It's constantly changing and you have to change as a person yourself and grow with that company uh, for it to be successful. So if you loved it when it was five people and now it's suddenly 50 people, that's a huge difference and it takes different skills different knowledge, different ambitions, different uh, objectives. So you really, I, I do think it's, it is hard uh, to keep that mindset as you're going uh, to uh, uh, through the, all of these stages with the company, very, very challenging, but it was very rewarding. I would love to do it over. So as, as uh, hard as it was, um, I would do it over in a heartbeat. It was really great. Another viewer, Ryan, says, what are some major pitfalls you've seen other companies fail and what are some pitfalls you have overcome? Um, Ruth, what have you what have you seen? I'm sure you've worked with, you know, well, many companies at this point. But. Absolutely have, actually. <laughs> but, you know, I do think the one of the things about i the one of the tenets of i that it teaches you is that most companies fail. Why, mm -hmm. Tria? Why do they fail? Because they don't have customers. That's right. So they're building something that no one wants. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the I-Corps program is really there to help you identify whether there are actually customers that want what you're developing. And, and uh, most um, scientists and engineers that start companies don't have difficulty with the technology, actually. You know, they're, you're experts in the technology. You can develop the technology, but where they miss is understanding whether that technology is really something that somebody wants. So that's really an important first step, I think. And even in our uh, SBIR program, one of the reasons that I would like to offer i to SBIR is they land in the program, but really not connected to the customer yet and what the customer okay. needs and wants. I, I definitely haven't seen as much as Ruth, but I, I really echo that point. I think for us, the places we've we've gone wrong and have had to course correct or, or similar are places where we weren't listening to the customer enough. We were hearing what we wanted to hear and not what they were saying and, and picking right. up something they weren't putting down and, and having the humility to really acknowledge that we don't know everything and we don't know what we don't know and we we don't know what's going on inside the head of the customer are all things that I think 
I think are, you know, could, could be pitfalls, you know, have been in some small ways for us, but haven't, haven't yet, yet driven us, driven us down. I think it's uh, worth mentioning that, you know, we spent this time, these six weeks in, in 2016, talking to a hundred different customers. And one of those customers became the starting point for another hundred customers in a different okay. segment as we started to, to grow the organization. And, and today we still do customer discovery. You know, we're a lot closer to the selling process than we were four years ago, but we're still discovering. We've built a um, what we call a thermoeconomic, a thermodynamic economic optimization model based on the information we've gathered from customers, so that we can start to understand how how they think about the system and the problem and the optimization, and and that that goes on every day. Today, I spoke with our CTO, and I, he said, "I just got off a call with you know this guy. I was looking for new data." for the model and, and continuing to do that customer discovery process. It's a lot more, um, I don't want to say a lot more rigorous because that's not true, but the hypotheses are getting a lot more narrow. You know, right. the hypotheses about what the value proposition are, are a lot more focused, but we're still using that, that scientific method to, to understand our customers and, and doing that not at the expense of human human stuff, right? We still need to understand the human being and what motivates that person and that individual, but, but the, the scientific method helps us do that as well. Okay. I'd love to talk about diversity a little bit. Um, I think some students or young scientists imagine that to get your feet on the ground with a startup company and be really successful, you have to be already well connected to venture capitalists or have money from your family already. Um, is there a place in, in entrepreneurship for people who might come from underprivileged backgrounds and have no resources and have really never known anyone in the business world at all? Yeah, uh, would you like me to? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you know, I would say that actually most people do not have those connections. So, uh, you know, especially coming uh, from the science and engineering background, I think the likelihood that you have connections to venture capital or you've started a previous business are just not uh, likely. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I don't think you should uh, let that stop you at all. As a matter of fact, um, you would be in the norm for people starting businesses in the STEM area. So absolutely. Uh, not a requirement <laughs> to have those connections. You will develop that. You know, one of the things that uh, Shreya said was, you know, if you can get uh, some initial support for your work uh, through uh, pub, you know, public sources like the SBIR program, uh, you it really does provide this in uh, stamp of approval. That's I think what Shreya was saying, trying to say that way. She said stamp, but I. I hope you understood she meant stamp of approval because uh, it goes through a very rigorous uh, review process by both uh, technology experts as well as commercial experts. And when that happens, people that invest like venture capitalists take notice and are much more likely to provide you with the funding that you need. So um, this is a, a, a absolutely wonderful pathway to success and, and does not require any prior experience in this area at all. Requires a good uh, technology and an understanding of the market. And I think all of, everyone is capable of doing that. Yeah, I, could, I couldn't agree more. I think there are also, uh, just to point out, there are also fellowship programs like the ones that activate or um, other opportunities that can help support, say, salary or other um, you know, needs to be able to, to build. You don't need to bootstrap this. I think one of the right. interesting things, um, kind of whether it's a myth or not, I don't, I don't really know, but the difference between a hard tech or a deep tech um, product development process that you need lab resources, you need specialized scientists. This isn't, um, you know, a bunch of folks in their living rooms coding. And, and I think that it's important to acknowledge that those resources, there are, are resources to obtain those resources. So Activate, I mentioned, runs a fellowship program for, for post PhD uh, folks who want to explore the market potential of their technology and it pays a salary and it allows you to spend two years 
really digging deep without worrying about where your next paycheck is coming from. And um, things like the SBIR program, you know, you don't need to know investors. In fact, the, the government grant process is a, a really excellent way to, to, you know, get a stepping stone to to build the thing that you need to build. And I, I couldn't agree more with what Ruth said. I think we need more voices, more faces. We need more um, diversity of thought, I think, in the startup world. And that's how we're gonna solve big problems like curing cancer or climate change or anything in between. And so I encourage it. Okay. Um, it, do either of you think there are, you know, big barriers to entrepreneurship that we still need to tackle either at a, you know, foundation level or academia, um, you know, would lowering some of these barriers lead to more creative and more life science startups to tackle some big problems? Yeah, you know, I would say, uh, and, and maybe you were hinting at this uh, as well. There are still uh, issues of diversity in terms of the people that are involved. There's no question. There's still very few women. And uh, uh, even in our SBIR programs, I'm not quite sure what the current uh, program level is and, and I-Corp programs. But there, I think it's um, still under 20% of the participants are women, maybe in the range of 10 to 20, uh, and, uh, but uh, that is not approaching 50%, for example. And uh, people of color, there we just do not have that sort of diversity in these programs. I would love to see that diversity. So if you are a woman or a person of color, don't feel like that is a barrier, please contact us to join our programs. We really welcome you. I'd really like to see that. I think we really miss out by not having that sort of diversity in this entrepreneurial culture. And um, maybe because these ideas are still relatively new, you know, in the whole world that we are not seeing it, but I really want to say that I encourage people to participate. Please do. Yeah, and an extension of that, I think is also uh, a, a lot of times a lot of times something I think that should, should get a little bit more attention, which is you really need an entrepreneurial sp spirit to join a small company, to work at a team that's less than 10 or 50 people, you know, and, and we as, as startup companies need you as people who have that spirit to, to work. So, you know, if, if you go through i and say, hey, you know, this doesn't have a customer, that's not the end of an entrepreneurial career. You can come work with, with us. And, and one of the things we're working on, you know, I sit here in, in Boston, Massachusetts, is how do we, um, you know, if people want to come work in Boston, how do we get better access to, you know, the best chemical engineer coming out of, you know, University of Texas and how do we um, facilitate those relationships and, and that um, kind of to, to Ruth's point, uh, encouragement to, to come come work with us and, and try something a little different. And so I think I think that is important. And you know, a lot of a lot of speak about startups is that you're eating ramen all the time and maybe they're not paying the same, we're not paying the same as Pfizer and, and Merck or something, but we are, um, you know, we are doing cool stuff and we'll, we'll, we pay people and, and we hope that we get the best minds working on these sorts of problems. Okay. Um, we have a question from a viewer, Haley, who says, what's something I can do right now during COVID to begin being a part of a STEM related business? Um, is now a, a tough time to get into this or? I don't think so. Um, I think that that many of us are, are operating. Um, many of us are still hiring. And um, I think, you know, reaching out and, and honestly, informational conversations, even if a company is not currently hiring, if anyone will talk to you about their experience there, you'll get a data point. You'll understand what life is like there at that company. And so I would, I would highly recommend, you know, a lot of us aren't traveling as much as we used to. We actually have objectively more time to have those sorts of conversations. And so, you know, whenever someone says, hey, I'm interested in, um, you know, I'm interested in via separations, I know you're not hiring right now, but would you talk? I always say yes. I'm not saying everybody does that, but I always will say yes. And, and you'll get some cool answers, I think. Yeah, I, I would just say that, um, you know, there, this, uh, these times will change and end, you know, and you really want to be prepared to take advantage of it. 
to put yourself on the sideline, um, you know, and kind of take yourself out of it, you now just extend this or prolong this period of being inactive or not doing what you want to be doing. So I, I think just putting yourself um, into it, not, you know, not everybody is hiring, but there still are a lot of people hiring. It's not a particularly good time to raise money necessarily, but you could still probably apply for government grants or do other things that will help continue your uh, uh, goals and aspirations as a business. So I definitely encourage you to do it. Yeah. Um, another viewer, Kira again asks, what is something you've learned from your experience that you wish you would have known when you first started a business? Well, I can tell you one that I think most people don't think about uh, when they start because they're so excited about their technology and the prospect of having a business. I certainly was like that myself, but you really need a plan. Mm -hmm. You really should have a plan for what you're going to do and when you're going to do it. So you need a timeline. You need to plot uh, your plan, you know, the, the steps that you're going to take to raise money and you need to plan the exit. Uh, that should not be left up in the air. You should have a, an idea of when you plan to exit who are your likely, what are your likely uh, scenarios for exit? Most of them are acquisitions. So you should know and have an idea of who those possible acquirers should be. I think it is not something that um, entrepreneurial education stresses enough, uh, this idea of planning. They're always on whatever the next step is for you, you know, wherever you happen to be. So here's your next step. Well, you know, that's nice. Uh, those are important, but really having the bigger picture in mind right from the start and always working towards those goals. I like having the big objective, you know, up front and uh, knowing. So every time a, an opportunity or a change occurs, you can always compare um, what this is offering you against your goals and objectives and your timeline. If it's going to detract from that, You've, you've got to be strong and say no. And if it's going to enhance it, then, you know, go for it. <laughs> anyway. Rhea, what do you wish you had known? Ah, uh, that was such a good one. I don't know if I can follow that up. I think, um, I, I don't think I necessarily appreciated the learning opportunities along the way. Mm -hmm. I think if you had asked me four years ago, you know, at what point, what point are you no longer the right person to lead this organization? I would have said, oh, as soon as we've developed the product and we have to sell it because I probably hate sales. And, and the reality is I don't hate sales and I'm, I'm learning how to do that. And it's an incredibly important part of this organization. And I wasn't going to get away with starting a company without doing some sales work. And so I, I think that, I think that that sort of growth opportunity and, and growth opportunity for really um, extension by extension, anyone on the team, because there are so many hats that need to be worn is, is, a, is been a pleasant surprise. Okay. Um, we also got a question for book recommendations. Do either of you have any favorite uh, reading to suggest for budding STEM entrepreneurs? Yeah, well, you know, there are quite a few books that we recommend for our i program. I'm happy to post those somewhere if someone would like to have them. Um, you know, uh, you know, a couple, I think, uh, depending on where you are, but you know, like talking to humans and the uh, you know a business uh, uh, canvas um, book uh, is also good reading. But there are several that I would recommend, and happy to um, post them on your website, Sarah, uh, at the end of the program. Okay, yeah, we can figure out how to share that. Yes. Um, Shreya, do you have any other particular recommendations? My current favorite books are a flavor of the month thing. So if you ask me next month, it might be a different thing. Okay. But um, the my current favorite is a book called Competing Against Luck by Clay, Clay Christensen uh, out of Harvard Business School. That is a, a really, I think, a really nice way to think about what you're doing for your customers, a really nice way to frame customer perspective. Um, the, the term he uses is job to be done. And it helps me as a technologist and a scientific developer really separate out what we're doing versus what our customer cares about and connect those dots. Okay, great. 
Uh, a question from Angelica. She says, for those who have never started a business, business before but aspire to, do you believe the probability of their first business succeeding will improve if they start their entrepreneurial journey with a business partner or are solo entrepreneurs in general equally likely in being successful? Well, you need a, you do need a team, I think. Yeah, I don't think a solo entrepreneur has much of a chance of success, really. I mean, you really do need a team. It takes more than one person. Uh, even just having the support of other people is really right. important. You just, it's really hard to uh, do everything yourself. And I think uh, if you have, and you, it says specifically business partner, I'm not sure if, the, if by that you mean uh, someone who has a business background, I'd say that maybe later on might be more important, but initially you really need a group that um, is all working towards this common goal. Maybe you all uh, understand the technology uh, or have some specific expertise related to what you're doing, that's perfectly fine. And, uh, but all of you must have the passion for the same goal. I think that's, and then you have to get along. That's the other <laughs> sure. And someone that you would like to be with because uh, uh, the, from the earlier question, you will put in very long hours. I think I probably on average 16 um, plus hours every day when I started my company. So the hours are long. I uh, echo echo that. And in addition to getting along with team members, you have to be willing to and truly trust them. You need to be able to let go of certain things and know that it's going to be taken care of. And if it isn't, that you'll figure it out. And, and, and it's not a personal thing. So um, our team has three, three co-founders, two that are actively involved, and one is a, a sort of more of an advisory position. And, and Brent, our CTO, and, and my co-founder and I um, have, have had different forms of interaction over the course of the years. When we started, we were taking every meeting together, and then we started having to divide and conquer, and then we realized we were taking zero meetings together. We were never communicating, so we found a way to, to you know, communicate, and so our um, interaction has absolutely evolved um, into COVID times where we never see each other, and um, absolutely um, have uh, figured out how to grow with the organization in order to be able to find our, our role and our opportunity. So we, uh, our team, I think, would be terrible with one person. Um, I think that the two of us balance each other out. We're super different, and that tension is healthy. We try really hard not to groupthink, and I think generally we're, we're very um, respectful of each other. Generally, okay, great. Um, we'll take we'll take one more question. Um, Ryan says, any tips for dealing with people with particularly strong personalities without suppressing those who tend to more towards following? Well, I mean, it, it is a common problem to, uh, too in startups to have someone who really um, wants to uh, dominate, but. Mm -hmm do think trying to get that person to understand how important that teamwork really is right from the start is, um, is really important. In my own company, uh, you know, I, I hate to tell all of you this, I think I was that bad person, you know. <laughs> I was just going to say the same thing. <laughs> let, me, let me just tell you how I handled it, <laughs> which actually I think changed me uh, for the rest of my career. Um, I uh, actually used a consultant, like a psychological consultant that did uh, behavioral profiling, um, had to look at that information, uh, how do I say, realistically about what it was saying. And from that point on, uh, I modified my behavior so that I wasn't so overbearing. <laughs> yeah, so that's part of being the entrepreneur and honing right. those That's right. And yeah. really, I have used it my whole life after that. So it was really valuable. But I do think, um, and, and the reason I did it was not because I thought there was a problem with me. I thought the, the problem was with everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Once I had gone through this behavioral testing, I realized that the problem was really with me. And so it was quite an eye-opening experience, but, but one that I really benefited from. So I think 
Um, if you suspect that you're having problems with team dynamics as you start your company, uh, going through this process is really valuable. And yeah. get early rather than later. This is really helpful, actually. <laughs> uh, that's that's great advice. I, I will. Yeah. I think I am also the strong personality on the yeah, team and yeah. probably something I could I could learn from. I do think it's very helpful to have someone you trust, uh, whether it's in or outside the organization, to kind of talk things through. And, you know, am I being crazy about this? I think people interactions are 100% the most important part of the job, whether it's customers or the team. And um, being very self critical, I think is important, you know, not to the point where it's destructive or, or you're not be able to make progress, but kind of having that continuous improvement. One of our values is to learn, grow and improve continuously. And I think that that speaks to every person in the organization, um, probably myself more than everybody else. Okay. Well, a huge thank you to both of you. That was so insightful into the NSF programs and entrepreneurship and, you know, what it's like in the the uh, meat of running a company. Um, a big thank you also to our viewers for joining us. For the students who are listening live today, please fill out the post event survey to help us improve these events in the future for everyone and you'll be entered to win a gift card. I'm Sarah Williams and this is the National Science and Technology Medal Foundation's STEM Spotlight Series. Have thank a good evening. So thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.